Hey friends, today I'm reading another true story called Saving La Lady Liberty, Joseph Perlicher's Fight for the Statue of Liberty. So I'm sure most of you know the Statue of Liberty was a gift from France and it is located in New York. And it's one of the first things that people used to see when they immigrated to the United States because most of them came by boat. So Joseph Perlitzer is a real person. He was born in 1847 in Hungary. He moved to the United States and became, um, he started working in newspapers. And he um, really felt like this gift from France to the United States was very important and he wanted to support it. And so this is his a book about that. Now later, after he passed away, they named um, a very important prize after him called the Pulitzer Prize. And it's awarded to books and newspapers, online writing, um, musical compositions um, that are really, really great. And so if you see, you'll see books that say the Pulitzer Prize winner, and it's very prestigious. So the author is Claudia Friedel, illustrated by Stacy Interest. And here's a picture of the New York Harbor. Joseph Pulitzer loved words, and the word he loved best was liberty. Maybe that's because Joseph, the son of a wealthy Jewish merchant, enjoyed freedoms that other Jewish boys outside of Pest Hungary could not. But his father died when Joseph was 11, and his world changed forever. Penniless from his father's death, his family's misfortunes, Joseph left home at 17 to join the army. But no army in Europe wanted a scrawny teenager nearly blind without his glasses. Fortunately, President Lincoln's U.S. Army did. When Joseph heard that he could get paid to fight for the Union, he set sail, determined to make a new start in the land of liberty. Now, liberty means freedom. And this is Abraham Lincoln. So he's going to fight for the Union, which means uh, he's going to fight during the Civil War. Proud to be a soldier in the 1st New York Lincoln Cavalry, the frail Hungarian was better suited for combat on the chessboard than on the battlefield. Bullied by his German-speaking regiment and bored with guard duty, Joseph couldn't wait for the Civil War to end. But finding work in New York City proved tougher than serving in the Army. Joseph might have been fluent in German, I mean, sorry, in French, German, Hungarian, and Yiddish, but a poor immigrant who didn't speak English couldn't compete with thousands of other veterans. There he is, sleeping in the in a park. After weeks of sleeping on park benches, Joseph hopped a train and headed for St. Louis, a city filled with German-speaking immigrants. Joseph felt right at home in this Riverport city, even if he couldn't find a job he liked. He shoveled coal, waited tables, dug graves, and even tended stubborn mules. But Joseph never minded working at the Mercantile Library, teaching himself to read and write in English. He especially didn't mind taking breaks in the chess room. Not only did Joseph's masterful moves draw a crowd, they drew the admiration of the owner of a German-language newspaper. When Joseph landed a reporting job with the Wachlich Post, I probably didn't say that right, sorry, he finally had a job he loved. Grateful for the freedom to write what he chose, Joseph uncovered corruption and inequality. His brash manner and relentless drive didn't earn him many friends, but no matter, Joseph kept moving up until he owned the newspaper alongside his chess playing boss. I like this story because it shows you how um, often people start out from very humble beginnings and they work really hard and they work their way up to come, become successful. After selling his shares at the paper, Joseph had money to spend and freedom to travel. At the 1878 Paris World's Fair, a, spectacular of the, a spectacle of the world's latest inventions, Joseph and his new bride were dazzled by Alexander Graham Bell's talking machine and Thomas Edison's magical music box. But it was the colossal copper head of August Bartholdi's unfinished statue, Liberty Enlightening the World, that captured Joseph's attention. So there's the head of the Statue of Liberty. Joseph Pulitzer shared August Bartoli's dream that one day the sculptor's magnificent monument to liberty would stand in New York's harbor, the gateway to the land of opportunity. 
So it sits close to Ellis Island. Ellis Island is where the immigrants used to come in by boat before, and they would be um, tested and do physical, be seen by a doctor and all kinds of things before they become, be, would be allowed into the um, country. But both dreamers knew that the French were more excited to give their gift of friendship than Americans were to accept it. The United States had agreed to build a pedestal for the statue of Bedloe's on Bedloe's Island in the heart of New York's harbor, but even New Yorkers weren't interested in paying for it. Pulitzer didn't understand how Americans could turn their backs on France, the country that had fought for America's independence. He returned home determined to rally his countrymen to pay for the pedestal. When Pulitzer brought, bought the New York World newspaper, he did more than just write about Lady Liberty. He put her smack dab in the middle of its masthead. So there's, uh, there she is on the top of the newspaper. And when he wasn't selling the news, Pulitzer and the pedestal committee hosted horse racing, boxing matches, and baseball games to raise funds. World-class musicians gave concerts, and writers such as Walt Whitman, Mark Twain, and the lesser-known poet named Emma Lazarus auctioned off their work. Pulitzer printed the New Colossus, Lazarus's sonnet of a worldwide welcome from the mother of exiles, hoping to inspire patriotism among other immigrants. But the pedestal fund still needed $100,000 to get Labor Liber Lady Liberty on her feet. One reason this is so important to him is because he himself is an immigrant, and the Statue of Liberty is basically a welcome to immigrants, and so he thought that was really an important thing. In 1884, nine years after Bartholdi began building his masterpiece, Lady Liberty stood fully grown in the heart of Paris, but the building of Bedloe's Island had stopped. The pedestal fund had run dry. Furious, Pulitzer scolded the wealthy New Yorkers who hadn't donated a penny. He warned that if New York didn't accept France's gift of friendship, Philadelphia or Boston would. This is what he wrote right here in the newspaper. What a burning disgrace it will be if the United States, if the statue of the goddess is brought to our shores on a French government vessel and met by the intelligence that our people, with all their wealth, have not enough public spirit, liber liberality, and pride to provide a fitting pedestal on which it can be placed. So he's really mad that they don't have this place to put the statue. So France wants to give it to the United States, but the United States is kind of like, eh, whatever. But the millionaires ignored him. Even the U.S. Congress and the governor of New York denied money for the pedestal. Frantic, Pulitzer searched for words to inspire his readers. What shall be done with that great Bartholdi statue? There is one thing that can be done. We must raise the money. The world is the people's paper, and now appeals to the people to come forward and raise this money. Let us not wait for the millionaires to give this money. It is not a gift from the millionaires of France to the millionaires of America, but a gift of the whole people of France to the whole people of America. Give something, however little. If he expected his readers to give their hard-earned money, maybe he should give something in return. It was risky, but Pulitzer decided to make his readers a promise. If a person donated even a penny, he would print their names and their story in the world. Pulitzer donated $1,000 and let the rest up to the people. The next day, he received a few names, coins, and stories. In the days and weeks that followed, more names, more coins, and more stories of sacrifice and patriotism poured in. Children emptied piggy banks, waitresses mailed tips, and poker players sacrificed jackpots. While Americans rushed to, to read the donors' names and inspiring stories, the French bid adieu to their beloved gift. It was time for Lady Liberty to make her journey to America. Loaded with 214 crates of the statue's pieces, the Azare survived a stormy start before making its way across the Atlantic. The world's readers worried and waited for news of the ship's fate. So there she is. She's in 214 crates going across the ocean. It's amazing she didn't end up at the bottom of the sea. On June 17, 1885, cheering crowds greeted the ocean-bartered Voyager as it sailed into New York's harbor. 
But with the pedestal only half finished, Lady Liberty had no place to stand. Now the crates filled her with copper. That crates now that crates filled with her copper skin and steel spine lay huddled on Bedloe's Island. Americans rushed to send in their donations. Let's see all her different pieces. More than 120,000 people pitched in to raise $102,000, young and old, rich and poor, and just like Pulitzer, veterans and immigrants. Together they saved Lady Liberty. Joseph Pulitzer had kept his promise. He printed every name and every story. Triumphant completion of the world's fun for the, pe for the Liberty pedestal. And so here's the pedestal they made, and then they put the statue on top. Now, here are some of the stories from people who donated. I sold two pumpkins and one squash at the market this morning, and to show you that I am in favor of liberty and lighting the world, I send the proceeds of the squash and the pumpkin. Ten cents. Signed, Mark T. And then he had another note. I am going to make Farmer Emrong sell some potatoes for the fun, too. Port Jarvis. I'm a little spaniel dog. My master is very kind to me, but he says he can't spare much for my, for my account. I read, I read your paper daily, that is, my master does, and I love liberty as much as most dogs do, even if millionaires do not. Please accept my might of five dollars. Truly, your dog Chow. Two months later. Your dog Chow finds he cannot attend Colonel Knox's lecture tonight and wishes you to accept his ticket money on account of the Bartholdi Fund, a dollar enclosed. That's kind of cute. So the master made it sound like his dog was writing the letter. I'm a little girl, only eight years old. I send 10 cents for the pedestal contribution. So in afterlife, I can say I did something towards its erection. I am a little boy, six years old. Mama gave four cents, which I put in my frog bank. I got three cents from Fanny, two cents from Claire, and one cent from Harry. Please give the 10 cents to the statue fund. This is from Albany, New York. We send you from our kindergarten of Davenport, Iowa, for the pedestal of Bartol... Bartoli statue, $1.35. I am a little girl belonging to the school and am writing this letter for the school. We have 26 children at our school. I am not quite eight years old, and so you must not expect to get a very good letter from me. Esther. The enclosed 50 cents is all we could find in Santa Claus's bank, which Papa opened last night. Please give it to Miss Liberty, whom we hope to see when we go to Coney Island this summer with our shovels and pails to dig sand. I am four years old and my sister's three. Yours, Johnny and Mamie. Enclosed, please find $2. Subscribe by the boys of the Hebrew Sheltering Guardian Society on a visiting day for the Bartoldi, Bartoldi Bedestal Fund, as below. Hoping the cause you have undertaken may prove a success. I remain. And then they sign their name. So people from all over the place were sending money so they could see the Statue of Liberty find her home. And here she is. On October 28, 1886, Pulitzer stood in his office and watched nearly a million people parade under the arch he had built for Lady Liberty's homecoming. It had been eight long years since Pulitzer first looked into Lady Liberty's eyes. Now with his own fading eyesight, he witnessed Bartholdi unveil his magnificent monument ready to welcome every traveler with a torch of hope and a promise of freedom. Pilcher thought that Lady Liberty's journey had re had remembered his own. Joseph Pilcher had always loved words, and the word he loved the best was liberty. So this is what he really looked like, and here's the Statue of Liberty's head for real in a photograph pretty impressive and if you want to know more about it here's all the information about him and what he thought here's some facts about him um, oh it says that he tried to join the British Army the French Army and the Austrian Army but because of his young age his frail build and his weak eyes he was rejected only the United States accepted him he was a self-taught lawyer he was a Missouri State Legislature and a New York congressman he built a 60-foot arch that spanned across the park in front of his newspaper building to welcome Lady Liberty. 
And here's more information. And here they are um, showing you how she was sculpted. Here's a picture of her. That's her hand. And here's the man who made her. And here is another picture of them erecting the um, pedestal. Oh, and here it says that um, Lady Liberty's right foot is stepping out of a broken shackle which symbolizes the emancipation for all the oppressed people. So if you're oppressed, it means you're not being treated very well and you're not being treated equally. And a lot of the immigrants that came to the United States from other countries, especially at the turn of the century, were not treated very well. They didn't speak English, they were poor, and they were looked down upon, and they um, came to America hoping for a better life, hoping for um, success, and hoping for better things for their kids and their families, and often they found that not to be true. So that's one reason he thought it was so important to have this statue because he came to this country thinking he would have a better life. <laughs> Excuse me. He ended up sleeping on park benches and no one would hire him because he didn't speak English. But he kept trying, kept working, and he became successful and he did learn to speak English. And again, here's tons of information. This is all about um, him. It's a timeline. And... Um, Wow, it's a lot. And here's another picture. So I've been to New York several times, but somehow I've never visited the Statue of Liberty. So I'm curious. Please tell me if you've ever visited the Statue of Liberty. If you've ever gone inside, that would be super exciting. I've never gotten to do that. But I will say that my grandfather came to the United States, and he came on a boat, and he went through Ellis Island. And I'm sure that one of the first things he saw was the Statue of Liberty. And I'm sure he also hoped for a better life when he got here. And um, maybe you have some family members that are immigrants, or maybe you yourself are. I would love to hear a little bit about your family story. All right, friends, happy reading.